Hey everyone, welcome back to Ed here in Apologetics. Really pumped you're joining me today. As always, we are brought to you by you with your support on patreon.com slash adhere in apologetics. Today I'm joined by the man behind the Elephant Philosophy YouTube channel. Today he's going by the name of Pascal. I'm going by the name of David Hume. Um, <laughs> welcome, my man. Um, joining me all the way from Europe. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm doing quite fine. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm really pumped uh, to hear your story and just talk to you about apologetics and philosophy and all these important things. So quick little rundown for everyone listening. What we're going to do is we are just going to give um, Pascal here, we're going to go by the name for today, of just a very a chance to share his story, um, kind of like going into his time as an atheist to now where he is a Christian. And then we're going to just kind of go through some follow-ups, some more simple questions. And at the end, we will open up for Q&A. So if you have questions or super chats, feel free to send those. And we'll get to those at the end. Um, but just in case someone doesn't know like who you are and what you do, Pascal, could you talk a little bit about yourself and like if they go to like the Elephant Philosophy YouTube channel, like what's going on there? Yeah, so I'm just a dude. Uh, I'm just a dude from Germany uh, with a YouTube channel, and I do basic philosophy of religion on these on my channel. Um, I'm one of these COVID channels, I guess. It started in March or April, where I simply had some time on my hand and thought. I've been studying philosophy of religion for over a decade now, and the idea was, why not just do something with all this knowledge? So I see so many opinions, videos, and posts about theism and atheism, and I'd like to comment on a few things, right? Mm -hmm. Set a few things right, share some of my thoughts, and explain a few, a few things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I can, I can keep going. So... I make videos on different topics of philosophy of religion, arguments for and against theism. Um, my main interest is not to be overly partisan. I just want to give an overview of the debates, arguments, and the viewpoints. That's it. Awesome. Um, we'll go into detail, like what got you interested in philosophy of religion um, in a few minutes. But I'm curious, just to start off, if you could share like a little bit of your story. Um, as we were talking, you were an atheist for like decades of your life. So could you talk a little bit about like what led into your atheism and kind of like why were you an atheist before you get into more of like the happy part where you become a Christian again? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so why was I an atheist? Because I thought it was just common sense. Mm -hmm. I all from I maintain that it's that way for a lot of at least Western and Central European population where they have lost connection to Christianity. I think mm -hmm. um, when I was an atheist, I considered it to be just common sense and self evidently true. Um, I saw theism as an outdated worldview, uh, a relic of the past, and. I was not against Christians or anybody. I thought they indulged in wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. I thought there's just no possible basis for the truth of that worldview, right? They believe that there's a man in the sky or some being that, some weird being created the universe. I thought, yeah, maybe that's so, but there's really no reason to believe that. We are in the 21st century. We have physics. We know basically the universe is a space-time manifold, and uh, maybe we don't know everything about its origins, maybe we don't know everything, but on the point of it, there's just no reason to believe that God exists, right? And I was so far removed from that idea, and just naturally. So, like, were you, like, did you come from, like, an atheistic, like, background, or did you have, like, a deconstruction from, like, Christianity or anything along those lines? Um, no, I, I guess that a lot of people are normally Christians, right? They don't, they don't go to church. They have no real, they are still members of churches where they don't go. They don't really believe anything that is being told in church. They have this weird... Well, maybe it's true, but they don't really care about it, nor do they really indulge in uh, thinking about religion that much, right? Mm -hmm. There is this natural disconnect, right? And um, when I grew up, I was interested in physics. I was interested in quantum mechanics and stuff like that. And I thought, well, that's obviously, that obviously gets the truth and that old superstition, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there again. I was <laughs> no, no, that that's basically it, and I, I can tell you how that changed, right? Yeah, yeah, and then, of course that's where we're headed towards. Um, so I'd love for you to talk about like, um, how did that change? Like that journey. You've been interested in philosophy of religion for so long. You're a Christian now. Like, what's that journey like to where like you're a Christian today? Yeah, that's that's very weird. Um, when after 2006. 2006 was the year when Richard Dawkins published The God Delusion and um, the New Atheists, I thought they were refreshing at first. Mm -hmm. They said things that others were sort of afraid to say. They were openly about, there's no reason to believe that God exists. Let's call it what it is. Call a spade a spade, right? And uh, Dawkins and Harris were interesting, but Hitchens was really blessed with a spark of brilliance, and I think everybody can agree. He was a brilliant speaker everything connected to rhetoric he did very well and um it was fun listening to him right mm -hmm. so um i watched a lot of hitchens debates and i thought he won a good share of them hmm. you can say by mere rhetoric but i thought he was doing well he was interested but someday he was of course soundly defeated by william lane craig and there was really no there was no way to pretend that that didn't happen. He was Craig wiped the floor with him. He had no idea what he was talking about. He couldn't, he couldn't respond to any of the arguments William Lane Craig made. He talked about other things. He talked about Mother Teresa and this and that. Um, William Lane Craig, on the other hand, did spark my interest. I think. So, um, think about it. I dived into the philosophy of religion and. I kind of quickly discovered there was an interesting case to be made, right? Mm -hmm. Smart people were doing really serious work. And from then on, I just became interested, right? And it took some years, probably four years, until I finally realized I'm a theist now. I do believe God exists, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was on the, on the basis of arguments, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah... From then on, that was 2013, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and from then on, it actually took some more years for me to become a Christian because I first had to, had to consolidate my belief in God, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I believed in God, but I wasn't that sure. Maybe I found out something new. I had to settle a little bit because that's not like flipping a switch, right? Mm -hmm. um, so as I settled with my belief in God, I can see, well... There are revealed religions, and at a certain point, I came to think that the religion of unconditional love and self-sacrifice, a message that shaped human understanding so fundamentally, was something that I should embrace. Mm -hmm. Right? That's That was a long journey. That took place over six, seven years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, um, studying for like, like philosophy, religion, you talk about, um, first off with your atheism, was it more of like an active, like strong atheism where it was like, there is no God? Or was it more like what you see in like the new atheists and a lot of atheists online where it's more just like an absence of belief in the existence of God? Like, what did that look like for you in terms of like your atheism? Uh, um, I, I think I was fairly convinced that God didn't exist because it was just a silly thing, mm -hmm. right? It was... That was something that people believed back then, a relic of the past that as now has no more validity to us, right? Uh, I think I was pretty sure that God did not exist, in fact. And I, I think I was not afraid to say so. But when I then were, was confronted with a with substantive, substantive philosophical case for it, I said, well, maybe there is something to this, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is not all just pie in the sky or something. Maybe there is a serious case. And I didn't just roll over and said, okay, I believe now. No, no. I came to realize that the case was intellectually serious, right? Mm -hmm. um, that there are many different kinds of reasons to get to God, but there are also many different kinds of arguments. And you can study these arguments. And you can look, do they present good reasons? Is there something to it? Or is it all just, you know, I don't know, hogwash or something? Oh, and yeah. I understood that some of these arguments were incredibly good. Not that I just accepted their conclusion right away, but they're good. 
they get at something and that's just not something to just uh, dismiss right mm -hmm. yeah yeah so yeah so like um in your journey you talk about like over this four year period especially really diving into like philosophy of religion after seeing like William Lane Craig dismantle Christopher Hitchens like what kind of arguments that were were compelling to you that kind of like led you towards theism Okay so well there are different many different kinds of reasons to believe in God different classes of reasons if we're talking philosophy mm -hmm. I think the argument from contingency that there is a grounding for all possible contingent reality so there are certain facts that may or may not have been. Look out your window, you see a tree, right? That tree does exist, but easily could have not existed. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole class of facts, propositions, you could say, and they may be true. They are true in the actual world, so to say, but they may have been false, right? Mm -hmm. So what explains actually the 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 fact that facts obtain that could have not obtained so this grounding for all possible contingent reality i think is something that is very very convincing convincing um because this all is based on the principle of sufficient reason the idea that there are at least for all contingent facts reasons for why they obtain and this leads to something that necessarily exists right some being that could not have not existed, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's some kind of fundamental ontological grounding. And just on the face of it, this already sounds a lot like theism, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, um, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that I believe the concept of God is coherent, right? Mm -hmm. In and of itself, is that's a modest claim. It just means the concept is coherent. But if you follow something like a modal argument from contingency, that would in, uh, entail that God actually exists. So this is something that to just a normal person would seem a little bit crazy, right? Mm -hmm. To just have a concept of a being, and that concept as such as it is implies its existence, but that's just the premise of the uh, modal argument from contingency as Plantinga formulated it. If a necessary being is even possible, then it exists, right? Mm -hmm. These are two, these are, if I would actually boil it down, these are two reasons why I would think God exists. There are other arguments, but normally it gets very, very complicated, I might say. So it's not, it's not like you have this argument and that presents the absolute reason that nobody can deny. So I believe a rational, fully informed and honest person can surely deny the existence of God without being dishonest or just flat out irrational hmm. okay so um i do want to say as we keep on going at the end we will have some time for questions i saw a bunch of questions come in we will get to questions here at the end um for our man pascal who runs the elephant philosophy youtube channel um but i'm curious um you talked about having like philosophical reasons but it seems like you, there's also this other other category you're going to potentially bring up is like reasons that kind of led you towards like a belief in theism am i right there was there something else beyond like the philosophical yes i believe there are other quite existential reasons to believe in god right i mean on the face of it all these reasons have been analyzed by philosophy as well but they are not strictly in the strictest sense at least they're not philosophical reasons there is a certain longing or maybe a, a just fundamental urge in people to believe and kind of uh, still there, right? Yeah, yeah. And then once you tear down certain barriers, I think there is a certain longing for God. I wouldn't deny that. But that is not in itself a, a philosophical reason. You can analyze this kind of longing, this urge for transcendent, in philosophical terms, but it is, in, in the strictest sense, not a philosophical reason to believe in God. And many people believe out of that reason, and that's not irrational. That's just nothing that, uh, it doesn't come from some propositional background, right? Hmm. So um, I'm curious, um, you, you brought up the argument from contingency. I didn't cut you off too soon there, did you? 
Uh, the argument for contingency, I can talk very, very long about yeah, the yeah, argument yeah. from contingency. Some, yeah, I was I was going to the argument from contingency, um, and then I realized that I cut you off there too soon because I had a specific question about it. Um, before. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, um, with the argument from contingency, I think that, I mean, I think we're obviously increasing a lot more, like from the philosophical literature, to, like this idea that there's like a necessary being, um, like uh, undercase letters, but there's like this idea of like the gap problem, um, that we'll yeah. see a lot. And like, so like when you like you attack the gap problem, maybe like an elevator pitch in a few minutes or so. Like, how do you get from like just say believing like oh there is some sort of necessary uh, foundation for all of reality to like the idea that it would come to like a god who's like you know omnipotent, omniscient, all these like attributes that we typically give to a god. Yeah, I would probably start to think about it in the way that philosopher Peter Van Inwagen put it. First of all, if you tell your typical atheist that there is a fundamental grounding of all contingent reality, that is something he will not be in itself not very be, not very comfortable with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this sounds, as I said, uh, already a little bit like theism, right? <laughs> the, uh, um, but... There are, of course, uh, other arguments. For example, here's the question. If something that is necessary, right, and mm -hmm. this is the grounding for contingent facts, and you have, to, you have to think about why, if this thing is in itself necessary, how can it ground facts that may or may not have been, right? Mm -hmm. How is that possible? If it simply entails these facts, then these facts would be just as necessary as the grounding of them. Mm -hmm. If and we can put this in possible worlds rhetoric, right? Mm -hmm. If a necessary entity entails certain facts, that means necessarily implies them, then they are true in every possible world of, as well. But then they wouldn't be contingent facts in the first place, right? So one way out of this is, of course, to embrace libertarian free will or contra-causal free will to think that this entity, this necessary entity, is free in a certain sense to bring about certain facts and not bring about other facts. It could have brought about a certain tree, but it was actually free not to do so. And that is actually an explanation for why certain facts are contingent, what other facts are necessary. Mm -hmm. That would be something that, that I, I would think... Now you have a necessary being, a necessary entity that is free with respect to its decisions, right? And that brings you very, very close to a personal nature of that necessary being. All right. Um, so, uh, sorry, I said that I just don't know when you, you finished or not. Just it was, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're all good here. Um, so... I'm curious now, we've talked a little bit, um, like this first bit, just talking about like theism and such, but like what kind of led you to like Christian theism, if you could dive into it a little more specifically, um, you talked about the idea of just like this ultimate, um, like I didn't say ultimate love story in a sense, but like you see the love, especially like through the cross and God taking the flesh, but like what led you from like a general like philosophical theism into like a Christian theism? Yeah, that actually took me quite a while, but first of all, if you just believe God exists, then you're basically a deist, right? Mm -hmm. You just believe there is a God. And then there are certain questions to ask, right? The first question is, has God revealed himself, right? That's obviously the question. Maybe he hasn't revealed himself, as I contemplated for some time. Maybe all the revealed religions are just wrong about this. And then, but... Thinking more about this, I actually came more and more to the conclusion that the message of uh, Christianity is something that I... It's hard, it's hard to put this in concrete terms, but it's something that actually stands out from not just from its time, but from any time. Mm. Um, there is something, I think, that is so essential to Christianity that isn't really really even properly expressed in the scripture. There is this fundamental problem, right? Mm -hmm. if, if there's an afterlife and there is a God, if the God is all loving, then he wants everybody to be in unity with him. Mm 
and blissful unity for eternity. Mm -hmm. But if God has created imperfect beings, morally imperfect beings, then this God actually, if he's perfectly just, cannot grant this kind of unity to just anybody they, because the beings simply do not deserve it, right? Mm. That's a sort of like almost paradoxical, almost a paradox. What could better uh, unify and overcome this contradiction than Jesus' suffering on the cross? This is kind of the God that puts love over pure justice, right? O over cold, mechanistic just uh, justice, you can say. It's a judgment. Maybe there's a judgment, but it's a judgment out of love. It is a judgment more of the doctor looking at the patient and looking, judging what is wrong with him, not the kind of cold judgment of a judge who bangs his gavel and hands out a sentence, right? Mm -hmm. That was my... That was something, and I think... William Lane Craig also mentioned something like this, that actually I thought this is such such a central truth and a central issue of all human existence that I thought, well, this religion really makes sense. Mm. So, so yeah, yeah, keep going. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'll, I'll, go ahead. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what would you say, like, um, was there, like, like an argument for the resurrection? Like, was that part of it at all? Because for a lot of people that look at like maybe like an argument for the resurrection or was it more of like the things you've been talking about um, already in terms of like bringing you to like a Christian theism? Um, I believe that the arguments for the resurrection have their place, but I think this is a newer development actually. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not actually aware of historically speaking that in uh, earlier centuries, this was the kind of approach that Christians took to arguing we have certain facts here in the manuscripts, right? Mm -hmm. We have certain papyri and we have this and that. Now we make this kind of Bayesian case that the, pro that the resurrection is the most probable historical uh, theory and then we're trying to convince people. What I think is actually arguments should rather they should rather give a basis for it that it could have happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you can prove such a thing to anybody. Yeah. I think this is taking, um, this is actually, I think, an apologetic mistake to give people the impression either we can prove it or we can't, right? And if we can't prove it, then they will just say, okay, then the religion is refuted, right? Mm -hmm. That's a mistake. I don't think you can really prove what happened 2,000 years ago with with a person. There's a little bit more. What you can do is basically say the facts are not against it, right? The evidence, there is some basis, some evidential basis for the idea, but it's not, uh, it's not that we can beat you over the head with a probability. I mean, some people make fun of Richard Swinburne when he kind of alluded to, well, there's a 97% probability uh that it happened. I know that's not exactly what he said, but this is the. I think that's the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one thing that I think for a, a lot of people, whether you're atheist or Christian, um, people wrestle with is the problem of evil. Obviously, there's a lot that can be said in the problem of evil. But like, did it play a role in like your atheism and all, at all? And then, like, as a Christian now, like, how how do you see the problem of evil um, from your perspective? Yeah, as an atheist, I didn't really think about this problem so much although I would at the time have of course said yeah clear I mean if God is all good why is there so much suffering case closed right yeah. uh, but if you read the liter literature I still think that the evils in the world can for a person be a good reason to not believe in God mm -hmm. but I also think that a reasonable defense of theism in light of the often horrific sufferings of the world can be given I myself have on my channel, given uh, I've made a video responding to the problem of evil, basically in general, but I've also made a video that gave an argument from evil against the existence of God. Mm -hmm. um, I do both. I think there is certainly, it would be foolish to deny that the problem of evil or the occurrence of evil in the world cannot give anybody a good reason to deny theism. That would be foolish, right? Mm -hmm. the, the real thing is that the issue is, we can maybe highlight that the issue is much deeper than that, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm following you. Yeah, 
No, no, that's that's what I think. And if you then read the Chris, the Christian, the theistic literature on this, I don't think anybody solves this problem to mm -hmm. the fact that we can say, okay, we're done with this now. Mm -hmm. But there are certain reasons, even in theism, to expect a certain amount of suffering. And I find what I find the most con convincing reason is this. Um, God could have created morally perfect beings. Mm -hmm. I believe that. And maybe he has. I'm not saying that this is, uh, this, I don't know what God has created. Nobody knows, right? Mm -hmm. But if God, additionally to that, let's say he has created a whole realm of perfect beings, just for the sake of argument, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about it. Now he says, maybe additionally to that, I'll create imperfect beings, right? Mm -hmm. If they're morally imperfect, then they necessarily will come into existence and bring about certain sufferings to each other. Mm -hmm. And maybe additionally to that, they have to live by their nature in an environment where they are conducive to certain amounts of sufferings. Mm -hmm. Maybe even their salvation hinges on the idea that they experience a certain amount of suffering. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's even possible, then we can maybe explain some uh, evil in the world. And if we think about what human beings are, how we understand ourselves, I don't think we could even imagine living a real human life without any kind of suffering. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, um, one last thing here, and then we'll go to some more general questions very briefly, and then we'll go to a little bit of a question and answer at the end. Um, but like, how has being a Christian tra changed your life, like in the way you live and the way you view the world and such? Like, how has being a Christian just like changed your life at maybe a more spiritual or emotional level? Um, that's a that's a great question. I think that I have that I'm calmer now than I was, but some people who <laughs> uh, uh, see my videos think I'm not that calm. <laughs> but I think I'm actually calm. I find a little bit of peace and a little bit of uh, uh, existential optimism. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think Christianity can really change your outlook on the world and on on people. I think. I think Christianity will leave you very, very few room for despair. And I think a lot of people who are disconnected from God who they just despair about politics, about certain happenings in the world, and oh, is this all bad? I think as a Christian, you have a certain different perspective on things. And uh, of course, uh, you have a hope to share to other people, right? Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so one thing I'd love to talk a little bit is you've been engaging a lot more in like kind of like the new atheism, like lack of belief. I know you've did some response <laughs> to Stephen Woodford. Um, we're not going to talk about like the other stuff, but just kind of like um, from the intellectual perspective, like what do you think of like lack of belief atheism and like how is like a theist in like philosophy do we kind of like in the a theist in philosophy? How do we like, confront this idea? Well, I mean, on my channel, I'm not trying to really convince anybody that God exists. Rather, I'm trying to advertise philosophy of religion and just good thinking, right? Um, so many atheists believe theism has absolutely nothing going for it at all. That's the mindset of these uh, people. It's just superstition and it's wishful thinking. And if you show them what an Alexander Proust does, what a Robin Collins does, or what a Richard Swinburne does, this will change a lot, I think. Yeah. Um, but you can also show them what atheists like Paul Draper does, what Howard Sobel did, or what Graham Oppie yeah. does. And maybe that's maybe exposing atheists to the works of atheist philosophers will open their minds way more than beating them over the head with a whole host of arguments for God's existence, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if they see, I believe, um, that an atheist like Paul Draper, what kind of papers he writes, what kind of arguments he brings, they will maybe say, oh, this, is all not, this is all not so simple as I once thought, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I'd love to talk about, and then I, there's a bunch of questions, so we'll probably get into a few more of them, um, or a couple things, is why do you think philosophy of religion matters? Like, I think that 
in like a like an internet circle oftentimes we'll hear like uh science will ex explain everything all these arguments are just absence of scientific data eventually they'll it'll explain why there's a universe science will explain all these things like um it's like when you deal with like almost like a form of scientism that's typically not even like described as scientism where it's like you need to prove god exists like how do we confront like that type of idea and philosophy of religion yeah uh, let's maybe set the scope a little broader why does philosophy matter mm. i think that philosophy matters because everybody does it everybody who tries to coherently and honestly understand the world that he lives in will do philosophy mm -hmm. they may do it badly but they do it the people who argue that philosophy is just useless they are just doing philosophy mm -hmm. they may be ignorant to the fact as they're ignorant of philosophy but they do philosophy mm -hmm. and um there's simply no way around doing philosophy. I think Schopenhauer put it accurately. Man is a metaphysical animal. We can't help it. We are beings in a world that we're trying to understand. And if we have to do philosophy anyway, we may as well do it well. Okay. So, um, and we may even come to some agreement. Mm -hmm. And if not, at least we have some idea of where we disagree and why. So the scientism is, of course, scientism is a philosophical doctrine. It's, it's doing philosophy. It's a certain commitment to knowledge, right? That's, uh, at least broadly speaking, scientific knowledge is the only real knowledge we can attain of the world around us. Mm -hmm. But, of course, this is, of course, um, self-referentially incoherent. How would you know that scientism is true? Well, you wouldn't. Science doesn't tell you that. You, these people themselves have to have a certain way how they get to see the world that way that only science works. And they don't get it from science either. So, Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of one last thing I'll throw at you before we go to some Q&A. There's a bunch of questions here. Um, is like, I don't know if do you have like, do you know what like an elevator pitch is? Like is that something that you've heard of in like Germany? I don't know if it's like an American thing or not. An elevator pitch? No. <laughs> Okay, What's so that? um, an elevator pitch is just kind of like this slogan we throw around where if like you're stuck in an elevator with someone and you have a couple minutes to argue for a position or convince uh, them just in like a minute or two, um, kind of like it's called like an elevator pitch basically because it's something you just go like, boom, like this is why I believe yeah, yeah. or you should hire me or something like that. Um, so with that in mind, like if you had to give like an elevator pitch for like the existence of God, like why believe in God? Um, this is the last thing I'll leave you with before we go to Q&A. What would you say? Oh, oh my god that, that's a, that's a tough one man i know i'm asking you to summarize like so much philosophy of religion literature in like a minute so you know i would probably say that i can't give you an elevator pitch for the existence of god but i can't give you an elevator pitch for the non-existence of god either you can't give me one so maybe you should ponder the issue <laughs> okay then i mean we can go with that <laughs> Um, so what we'll do now is we'll open for Q&A for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in. You can tag me, and you can also send it a super chat if you want. Um, first question here is from the London Theist. How's it going, Dean? Um, interesting question here. Why the name Elephant Philosophy? Uh, yeah, because I like elephants. <laughs> you could give, oh, yeah, they are uh, majestic creatures, and they're intelligent and wise, and they represent philosophy. It has nothing to do with that. I just like elephants. I thought, well, yeah elephant philosophy what's the love with elephants like why this love are they well i mean they're cute <laughs> on the face <laughs> of it but they are wonderful creatures i mean um elephants are indeed very intelligent they're very emotionally intelligent they uh they are really a, maybe they are probably among the most intelligent animals they're majestic they're cute they're social animals i love them <laughs> uh, a little fun fact just so you know um my friend um was once hit in the face by an elephant and he was in a viral video that had like millions of views it was on a bunch of tv shows so i do know a thing or two about elephants so yeah. how, did, how did that happen uh she got too close to it and then the elephant hit her across the face like trunk the face or something like that oh now she's world famous um so there's that. Uh, a bunch of just well <laughs> she is well. Luckily, um, everything. Okay, well, okay. Um, next thing is this. 
is from – I'm pulling it up here, sorry uh, – from Maverick Christian. It's a super chat. Thank you so much for your super chat, um, Maverick. He says, um, are you a philosopher or a philosophy student? No, I'm neither. So I'm just a, I'm just a layman who's interested. I think a lot of us are. Philosophy is a very exciting um, field of study. Thank you for your super chat. I really appreciate your support, Maverick. Um, the next question here is from Miguel um, Yolate. Um, what do you think about the idea of non-resistant non-believers so going into like divine hiddenness and such here? Yes. Uh, it's Jay Schellenberg's um, argument that a loving God would want to have a relation with at least – every moral agent you can say or every person and uh yeah i i honestly believe that the search for truth is actually something that is incredibly value for human beings and certainty could be actually detrimental to the natural curiosity and the moral and spiritual growth that people undergo when they search god mm -hmm. i think that's that's basically um that is basically my super condensed version of my response to that argument, but it's a good argument. Uh, another question here, I'm, because you're German, um, we talked about this off stream, but because um, I, I always love talking with so football when I'm talking with a European, but are you a Dortmund or are you a Munich fan? Um, talking about Bundesliga here. Uh, yeah, I lost you a little bit. Um, I, I'm not a particular, uh, I'm not a fan of a particular uh, uh, German football club. Uh, Liverpool. I love the idea of go Liverpool. Um, you'll never walk alone. So that's why I'm also kind of a Dortmund. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Holland and Brenner, uh, they're all on the watch. They do it as well, but a lot of clubs do it. Mines in Germany does it as well. <laughs> it's true. It's a pretty good um kind of like slogan going on. Um, question from Joshua Phillips here. It says, "Do you have thoughts on the idea of universalism?" Yeah, I'm a hopeful universalist, and I, I really gravitate toward that position. Um, I think I basically have this idea that it's very well possible that in the end everybody gets saved one way or the other in ways we could even, not even imagine. So what do you make of like everything in the Bible that would talk about um, hell? Obviously, you're not a theologian. You focus in philosophy. But like, what do you make of like the Bible and this idea of hell? Okay, so yeah, I'm really not a theologian and I should probably not talk too much about these issues. There are other people who know their stuff and they should talk about it. My idea is basically that a lot of the passages in the Bible, they that people think reference hell or eternal torment or something like that, they are, and the afterlife in general, I might say, are really passages that talk about overcoming death it's just, the question I think that is being discussed is more that God is so great that He will overcome death, and uh, I cannot, I cannot refute somebody who would proof text me with certain verses. Well, there is there is talk of eternal damnation, there is talk of hell. I just think that uh, the case is not so clear cut, and maybe you can read some David Bentley Hart or something. I don't know. Yeah, um, well, I appreciate your honesty. Um, another question here from the London Theist is, um, have you ever had a religious experience? If not, what do you kind of like view of them? Yeah, I had some what one might call mystical experiences. Um, I remember an experience I had when I first came, not to Christianity, but when I first accepted the existence of God, I remember laying in my bed and thinking, this is overwhelming. For the first time, I had a real emotional realization that there may be this higher reality, this transcendent grounding of reality that God really exists. And that was, it wasn't horrifying, but it was a little bit scary, maybe even. Uh, but uh, that actually showed me that I'm not just, uh, that it's just not um, an intellectual consent to a certain proposition, God exists, but that I really start to think this is true mm. um n next question here um just trying to fly through here um from kyle volmar plantikas volmar he said what well, says um what do you think about the best theory of free will uh the best theory 
I don't know if I think it's the best theory. I um, I have my own way of of defining free will and dealing with it, um, but I'm not that much into uh, certain theories about it. I'm just more on the side of um, defending free will from obvious objections against it. So I probably should not comment on that. Hmm. Um. Uh, another question is um, dealing with the problem of evil. How do you view like the incarnation? Um, like, do you think that's like a potential like partial theodicy uh, to, to like the problem of evil? Uh, wait, that. Uh, I think the incarnation helps with the problem of evil. Oh, yes, yes. Now I understand the question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's actually something which led me to Christianity, right? Because we are beings in need of, of moral cleansing, right? And it is a certain way of, there is a certain sacrifice, not just to that the Son gives, but certain sacrifice, at least in a metaphorical nature, that God is willing to forsake just pure justice. Mm -hmm. and Because love trumps justice in its understanding. So... You would think that somebody, if somebody forgives, if somebody shows leniency or something, that's not perfect justice in this sense, right? You are guilty of a certain crime, but you are forgiven, right? And this is a certain sacrifice of perfect justice, or maybe it's a kind of misunderstanding that we think of justice apart from love. Maybe there is, in a Hegelian sense, some higher reality that we witness but yeah i think it helps with the um i'm not too sure how it helps with the problem of evil in general but seeing that we are creatures that are in need uh, that that are morally flawed very very fundamentally i think explains a lot that we also live in an environment that is flawed in this way right mm -hmm. um Another question here. Um, oh, we'll probably go for about seven, eight more minutes of questions, and then we'll start to wrap things up here. I don't want to keep um, my boy Pascal here for too long. He says, um, what do you think of the idea about modal truths, about free will actions? Like, you got to actualize a world where I freely choose to do something, or is that logically contradictory? Yeah, I have my, <laughs> I have my very own theory about this that I think uh, – uh, there are certain misunderstandings in uh, uh, the general understanding of modality. I think that modality is not binary in the thing that are possible worlds and impossible worlds. There is sort of a middle ground. I think there are non-maximally possible worlds where they are possible in a certain sense, but there's an overriding reason why they are not perfectly possible. And I think this helps with the question of free will. Um, in some sense, I, I am a Molinist. I think that uh, God foreknows the uh, free actions of free creatures. Free essences uh, behave in a certain way that God knows about. I'm not an open theist or somebody who denies this kind of middle knowledge that God has. I think that, yes, creatures are free to act in different ways, but since they will a certain way, these ways are not perfectly possible. I think this is now comes across as a very arcane, so discussing some very arcane details here, but my view is basically that we should give a non-binary account of modality and certain th certain problems can be solved that way. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, next question here is, um, you talked a little bit about there being good arguments for theism, good arguments for atheism. Like, why did you choose Christian theism over, like, say, like, atheism in terms of, like, overall? Um, yeah, I think theism makes more sense than atheism. Mm -hmm. That's basically... So, obviously, um, this doesn't already imply that Christian theism makes more sense than non-theism, but I think the way I got to know Christianity and the way I got to understand Christianity, I think it really makes a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And it is basically the only religion that, as far as I can think of, is... Uh, it's really in tune with the with the f fundamentally flawed nature of human beings. No other religion, other religions 
often command you to do something or have a certain set of rules that you follow in order to Christianity is, I think, the religion that really goes to the human heart, to the human soul, and understands human beings as flawed creatures, as they are in need of help, basically. Mm -hmm. You can just call it help. You can call it redemption. There are a lot of things you can say about it, but yeah. Mm. Um, we'll, we'll do a few more questions here, probably about two or three left. Um, Miguel says, who are your favorite Christians slash non-Christians on Twitter? And you can expand it if you wish. Um, I'm actually not that I am on Twitter, but I'm not that um, inspiring Christianity is a nice account. Uh, that seems to be a nice dude, it's an intelligent person. Um, uh, I have to give a shout out to the Real Atheology podcast guys, they're doing a tremendous job. They actually helped me to do videos because they gave me uh, material where I did videos and I talked to them. They're very nice people. Uh, Renal Rouser is cool, I like Renal. I briefly interacted with him a few times. Jeff Lauder is somebody I follow from uh, the Secular Outpost. So, yeah, that's just some people. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple more questions left. Uh, Caruso Project says, it's me and a group chat that I have no clue about any philosophy. Can you explain B theory of time for me, layman of layman? Do you have, like, an elevator pitch for, like, B theory of time? And are you a B theorist? Uh, no, I tend more to the A theory. The B theory of time says the following. Um, Past and future exist just in the same way that the present exists. It just, you would say, they exist simpliciter, right? So what we call the present is merely indexical. So you can treat past and future, temporal becoming, in a way that you can treat a geometry, right? Mm -hmm. You can say in the same sense that the place over there does not exist, uh, does exist, just it, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. The place over there exists, just as the place where I am at exists, and there's no reason to think that a place over there doesn't exist just because I'm not there, mm -hmm. right? In the same sense, there's no reason to think that the future does not exist just because this moment here exists, right? Mm -hmm. And if you treat, uh, then you have certain certain broader views about there are there's still discussions about what kind of a B theory, what does it entail and thing. The basic thing is that existence is basically a, you can treat existence as a, not bound to any kind of temporal moment. So an, an object exists is it if it exists at some time. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the A theory an object exists if it exists now. I don't know if that was so great, but that's uh, no, no, no. I think that I think that's really helpful. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, we'll go to probably one more question left here. Um, there's an Alex Bruce question, so that's always fun. Um, it says, "What else? What do you think about existential inertia? How much would you be? How much would he argue against it being prim a primitive necessity?" Yeah, that's a that's a decent question. How would I argue against it? Um, there are certain problems with existential inertia as uh, understand, understood as a power on a, a theory of time because that would actually be a power that references a state of affairs that doesn't even exist. If you think of existential inertia as a power to remain in existence, then actually this is a power that references a state of affairs that is just non-existent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so... If, if, for example, a chair has the uh, power of existential inertia in order to, it has the power to exist at two minutes from now. Well, two minutes from now is just, uh, there's nothing, there's a non existent state of affairs, right? That certainly is some problem. No, but I don't think there's a real refutation of existential inertia to be given, right? Um, I have actually some different views that existential inertia may be actually, um, <laughs> I, I cannot go too deep into this, but one of the ideas is, for example, think of two objects coexisting, right? Uh, there's an, an apple and a banana, say, right? The apple completely is unchanging. It does mm -hmm. not change at all, and they do not causally uh, affect each other. Now, the, so for some reason, the banana changes. Why should that have any bearing on the existence of the apple? The apple just remained unchanged throughout this, right? 
So why would I think that the, the Apple now needs a kind of power to stay in existence? I think the fundamental question is rather why does the Apple exist in the first place? Um, because that's my view that if something changes, that is actually the necessary condition for any kind of change going on, right? Uh, for, for any kind of time moving. Time is simply... Uh, time is simply what measures change, right? If if no change occurs, time doesn't flow. Mm. So now, if you think about it, if the banana somewhat changes, yeah, then time moving forward, it moves from one state to another. But the apple did not change at all. It remained unchanged throughout this time. Now you have to say, why would the apple need a special kind of power to stay in existence just because some other object undergoes change? No, the, quest, the central question is why does it exist simpliciter? Mm -hmm. um, one last question we'll kind of go with here um, is uh, from Rene. Um, who are some of your favorite philosophers, like from the Christian and atheist side? Like, who do you read the most? Who do you respect the most from both sides? Um, yeah, that's a lot of people. I'm a fan of Schopenhauer, who was this ardent atheist, but I thought he was a great writer. And uh, I just like to read Schopenhauer. Seriously, I just like to read him. I think Paul Draper is a brilliant philosopher. Howard Sobel was a genius. Uh, Alexander Proust is a genius. Um, Robin Collins is great. William Lane Craig is great. There's so many great people. I just, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that most of the big names in philosophy, religion, are just people who do the stuff they do very, very well. And I respect them very much for it. So. Mm. Yeah, man. Well, there's a lot of great ones out there, and I respect you a lot. You do great work on your channel. Thank you so much for your time. Is there any kind of like last thoughts you want to bring up before we start to wrap things up here? Uh, no, I don't have. A, I just want to thank you. That was very pleasant. Uh, thanks for having me on. Nice interview. Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. It was so much to have fun to have you on. I really encourage everyone. If you don't subscribe to Elephant Philosophy, it's definitely worth a subscription on YouTube. It's all kinds of great videos coming out there. Um, I'd encourage everyone here, if you're new to it here in Apologetics, be sure to subscribe and leave a like on your way out. Uh, like Plantigas Bulldog said, if you, I can't give everyone a wrench, but I try to give people that I know who you're talking, if I know who you are more of. Um, if you're new here, uh, thank you. I encourage you to subscribe. And if you enjoy the show, you can support the show on Patreon. We're a little bit over 80% funded, so one, three, five dollars a month. Anything helps. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Maverick Christian, Joshua Phillip, um, Kyle Vomar, X Rabbit, everyone else that tuned in. Um, and finally, to you, my man Pascal, who runs the Elephant Philosophy YouTube channel. Thank you for staying up late for, with me in Germany and your time, man. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, blessed be everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Mm -hmm. Have a good evening. God bless.